your mind way, way, way back to the ancient Near East, to a time of turbulence, kings in vast succession rising and falling, and prophets and priests running around with conflicted messages, food shortages, anxiety, a little bit of chaos, with kind of a penumbra of military overshadowing everything, the armies growing and the threat of invasion looming. Step back into the days of Jeremiah, to the land of Judah, on the eve of its destruction. You may remember that the United Kingdom of Israel didn't last all that long, relatively speaking. King David, the infamous one, famous one, both, uh, took the confederated tribes and united them into ancient Israel. And then his son Solomon reigned. And to save all the details of that, things kind of had a little bit of a downward trajectory. And when Solomon leaves, there's a dispute over the throne. And Israel breaks into two the northern kingdom that retains the name Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah, much smaller. And when we come into the time of Jeremiah, the northern kingdom of Israel has already been invaded and squashed, to put it sort of mildly. And now Judah's on the cusp of facing a very similar fate under a different empire. But the reasons for their sort of demise are really similar. You may also remember that the ancient Israelites, who become ancient Israel, had a particular relationship with God. God called them as God's own people to live in a particular covenant under a particular law, those first five books, Torah. And the purpose of the law was for God to be their God and they to be God's people to live as a blessing to the rest of the world. And you could roughly break the law into two giant kind of segments. That about worship, and that about society and justice. And the law is deeply concerned with both. But it's clear from God's words through the prophets that Israel and now Judah are really living into neither. That they have an inverse relationship. Right worship of God and connection to the holy leads to a society that is more just, that has a concern for the poor and for the widow and for the orphan. Conversely, a society that begins to forget God, where worship becomes just something to check off your calendar for the week, has an inverse relationship to society degrading. Various prophets accuse Israel and Judah of unjust scales in the market, cheating people, forgetting the laws that surround caring for those who can't care for themselves, the widow, the orphan. There's a lot of accusations of wealth accumulating at the top and creating massive disparity between people who have and people who don't. And so these two have a kind of negative well, positive feedback relationship that leads to negative places. And that's basically what God is saying through the prophet Jeremiah in our reading today, using some lovely rhetorical question devices. Like, come on, Judah, your ancestors were brought out of slavery in Egypt, led through a wilderness, and brought into an incredible land of plenty. Geez, you have short-term memories. Has anyone heard of a nation whose God did that for them? By the way, a faith God. But have you ever heard of a nation who then forsook God that brought them such good things? No, but look at you people. Forgetting God, creating unjust systems. And God concludes with, my people are guilty two things. Forgetting me, God, the fountain of living water, and building cisterns, 
cracked cisterns that can contain no water. And it's a pretty just bereft, bleak kind of statement to make about how people are acting. And it'd be really easy to just be like, oh man, Judah and ancient Israel, they certainly got that wrong. Except that it seems to be a pretty good statement about human inclinations in general. I pause it for you the very beginning of like a mythic garden in Eden where people forgot God and turned to something that did not bring them life. And one could say that since that time, we've been doing kind of the same thing. So it's not good to just point fingers at people in our Holy Testaments and say, ah ha ha, they got it wrong. We do the same thing, I think. Cracked cisterns that don't hold water. I don't know. I think we're pretty guilty of putting the shovel in the ground and digging some of our own kinds of cisterns. <laughs> Work, that's a pretty important cistern to dig. Whether it's in the home, that's work, or it's out somewhere else in the office or whatever, we, we begin to dig a career for ourselves, a kind of work where we, we try to put all of our life's water into it to bring us meaning. And you know for a time it does. But then maybe industry changes, and suddenly we've got all kinds of new rules and codes, and it's not the same job. A little water leaks out. Or maybe we realize it just doesn't work for us anymore, or we retire. And suddenly everything we thought we knew about who we were, cisterns drop away. And we dig cisterns for our families also. We're born into some kind of unit. And as children, we desperately want it to hold water for us. And for some of us it does, and for some of us, the cracks at the bottom are so big, we never drink from it. And maybe we have then the opportunity to eventually configure our own family. You and a cat or a hamster, or you and your 20 children, it doesn't really matter. But we want that to hold water for us too. But people are people, and cracks seem to form. And I think we also spend a lot of time digging, digging more kinds of cisterns about our worldview, how we see the world. We construct it. We know where we fit in our, in our world and in our society. Until we don't. Until everything changes so quickly. Maybe it's a pandemic, or maybe it's technology, or it's the next generation, and the water cracks out. I could go on and on. Hobbies, physical health all the things that we build in our lives to hold our lives, that we think will bring us meaning and satisfaction endlessly, they all crack. And I think it's true for spirituality too. I think sometimes we build a cistern and we think, this is the God cistern, the spirituality one. And we begin to pour into it all of our experiences, all of the things we think about God, all of the ideas we have about God, and it's, a, it's actually a beautiful one. But then at some point it begins to be a little in our own image. We see ourselves reflected in it. And we stop putting water into it. We think, I used to pray a lot, that was great. And I've read the whole Bible. I know all the funky stuff that happens in Judges. I don't need to do it again. I've been confirmed. I know God, and I know my answers about faith. And we forget that even beautiful, helpful cisterns can crack leaks. And if we don't add any water to it, even then, it all begins to evaporate. And the problem with the cistern is that they don't last. They're stationary, they're in the same place. And, you know, <laughs> this is the problem with Judah. They built all the wrong kinds of cisterns, thinking that it would feed them forever. All of their wealth, that would protect them, and all of their kingly power would, would, would save them. And their false sort of relationship with God would just go on perfectly forever, but it all cracked. And we're back to the first part of what God said. You've forgotten God, the living water. They just walk by the taps. And see, that's the thing. Cisterns are okay. But you know, the water in a cistern, it gets stale. 
It's subject to stagnation. Let's not talk about animals that fall into them. Ugh. But water from a cistern can support you for a long time, but it's never as good as living water. It's not as good as groundwater that swells up from the deep, that is cool and refreshing, that is sweet always and unending. And see, that's what God compares God's self to. God says, I'm not even like water in a cistern. I'm the real deal, flowing up and flowing out always. And maybe the primary problem with cisterns is they're stationary. But see, we're always changing. Things that happen good to us change the cisterns, but they don't move. We have to find new places for life. And things that happen to us that are less good, the cisterns, they don't satisfy us anymore. But the living water of God is always flowing. And it's always changing. And it's always finding us. And that's the thing about the living water of God. It's not stale or stagnant. It comes to us fresh. And it offers us whatever we need for the next part of our journey. It rises up and it quenches our thirst. After we've been on a long journey, when we haven't returned to ourselves for a while. And it finds us when we're on the verge of dying and it saves us. When we've been lost for a long time. When we don't know or remember who we are or where we're going. God's life water restores us. And it cleanses us when we've been sullied by life. Or when, you know, disappointment and grief seem to just be coating us. God's water has a cleansing effect. In God's water, it invites us to come and rest. To be at peace beside the still waters and the spring. And smell the sweetness of the and find our peace. It's very different than a sister. It gives always of itself and gives us always what we need. Whatever it is, it finds us. And no, we can't contain it. And no, it keeps moving. And no, we can't control it. And yes, it is for everybody. But that's the beauty of living water. There's enough. There's enough in the ground, always swelling up for all of us. And so sometimes the cisterns of our life, they're good. Our hobbies, our family, our loved ones, our work. But they're never going to bring us the meaning endlessly. It's not exactly the place to lay our hope or our future. It isn't necessarily what gets us through when the times are hard and the drought comes. But that's why the living water is always flowing, always moving towards us. So despite our system, cisterns, <laughs> the cracked ones and the uncracked ones, may we always remember to return to the source, happily at last, of our lives, to the God who is always flowing out and up and towards us with water that will bring us life now and forever.